raise your arm, <coughs> wave, and then we will give the floor to all the questionnaires in order of appearance. Who would like to start questioning session? Don't be shy. Yes, please, go ahead. The rule is, in each and every table, you will find a microphone. Press the button and speak. Okay. Thank you for to both the speakers and the talk were really very interesting. I'm an archaeologist, and I think that I'm the only of the few here in Singapore. And I'm a paleoanthropologist, actually, because I'm dealing with uh, prehistory and not with, uh, you know, a classical archaeology. So, at the moment, although I'm working on Manisi and I'm working on the other uh, earlier site, I'm focusing my research uh, on uh, the role, um, the, the relationship between um, behavioral evidences in terms of stone tools and genes. And uh, specifically, I'm dealing with the grinding stones, which are related uh, to starch processing. And uh, I'm working on uh, Russian collections because nonetheless the, Ru the Westerns are considering the Russians not a skilled archaeologist. I think that they are instead very skilled. And in that collection you can find a lot of evidences since they hadn't been stripped out from you know, our kind of uh, typological um, <laughs> kind of issue. So uh, my question is, uh, what about uh, the occurrence of uh, the gene AMY1 in Neanderthals, in Denisovans? And we know that this gene is definitely expressed and multiplied in anatomically modern humans. Is there any other genes? that are somehow related with carbohydrates digested. Because apparently, without having these genes expressed and mostly multiplied, people cannot digest the carbohydrates. And I found a consistent kind of co-occurrence when um, looking for grinding stones in early Upper Paleolithic site across Eurasia, considering Western, uh, Western Eurasia and uh, Siberia and, uh, this, uh, and even uh, Southern uh, Europe uh, site, uh, and the occurrence of anatomically modern humans. While apparently in Neanderthals and eventually in Denisovans, there are no evidences of the appearance, of the emergence of these kind of stone tools. Uh, so, so this gene, uh, amylase gene, yes, is sort of occurs in more copies in populations that uh, eat a lot of starch, like in Japan and things like that. Uh, so, it, it, Neanderthals and the Nisman genome sort of look like modern human hunter-gatherers, not these extreme carbohydrate eaters. So, that's the only thing I can say about that, in terms of number of copies. Um, I am not an expert enough on, on other genes involved in carbohydrate metabolism to say. There's nothing of the things with amino acid changes that stand out in terms of carbohydrate, but you know, um, I think much of the interest would be in sort of gene regulation. We understand that. Uh, also, the regulation of gene expression, how much you express of the, and we understand so little of that in reality. So. There is a, a connection between uh, the, the capacity of our brain to use glucose as a fuel compared to glycogen got out of other processes like gluconeogenesis or other things. So you were mentioning about the importance of proteins actually in brain development and uh, of course the expensive tissue uh, model is supporting this uh, since many years, but mostly in the, for, for, 
three to five uh, to five years of our development while we are child, actually our brain is working just only on glucose. So we need to introduce somehow glucose in our diet. So children can get glucose, actually lactose and maltose, out of breast milk. But what happens after? If we cannot actually digest carbohydrates. Uh, but I mean, we can. All humans can we digest carbohydrates. Yes, yes. Well, we don't know, except that they had brains that were just as big as our brains, right? So, the only thing we know, I would say. Other questions? Yes, please, go ahead. I, I have a question for Professor Thackeray. Um, so, I found your um, concept of a probabilistic species very, very interesting. I'm kind of wondering how that would relate to um, whatever definition of a biological species one um, adheres to. As for example, what I was taught a long time ago, a species cannot interbreed with another species. But yet we've heard in Professor Weber's talk that um, ancient humans were apparently quite fond of interbreeding and there was a lot of horizontal gene flows there, which presumably have resulted from them being able to interbreed, right? But yet, I think that by your metric, many of those uh, ancient humans would belong to a completely different species. So is it time perhaps to do away with that old definition and just go for statistical or cladistic definitions and forget about um, any other biological meaning? Well, thank you. That's a very good question. And can I try to answer it by referring to chimpanzees. Today we have two species of chimpanzees. The taxonomists will recognize Pan troglodytes to the north of the Congo River and there's the Bonobo Panpaniscus to the south. So alpha taxonomy has been applied, A and B. Now I've applied my mathematical technique to skulls of Panpaniscus, the bonobo, and Pantroglodytes to the north. Bernard Wood did the same. And remarkably, when Bernard Wood looked at A and B of the same species, Troglodytes alone, the mean value after something like, I don't know, 5,000 regression analyses or something like that, uh, in the order of thousands, he found a value of exactly minus 1.61 as a mean value, taking pantroglodytes versus pantroglodytes. When he did the same thing for pan paniscus, remarkably, the mean value, based on exactly the same kind of regression analysis, A on B and B on A, the value was minus 1.61, and this is astonishing. Those results that he published were published in 2013, whereas my paper was 2007. So Bernard Wood had actually confirmed that this statistical method appears to be holding up when you look at variability within a species. There was just a little problem that when one compares Panpaniscus with Pantroglodytes, well, the results showed a degree of overlap in the distributions. So Bernard Wood took the view that my method didn't work, that it couldn't separate Panpaniscus from Pantroglodytes, that there was some degree of overlap. But just last October, last year, it was shown from genetics that Panpaniscus and Pantroglodytes have been interbreeding 200,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago, which helps to explain why there is a small degree of overlap between the Paniscus and Troglodytes data. And actually that seems to suggest that Thackeray's method is holding up. I think it would seem to suggest that our human tendency to want to categorize perhaps isn't entirely compatible with biology. In that case, I, I, I think, you know, that Possibly the vulnerability in the statistical method would be that you could get tricked by shared, I suppose, the derived characteristics. 
right? And that's something that one has to be wary of. Absolutely right. No, um, I'm very humble in indicating that this method may not be the best method, but it's an attempt uh, using modern data as a frame of reference to help us define a species. Charles Darwin, in The Origin of Species in 1859, says in his last concluding chapter that it is necessary to try to determine the amount of variation within a species. And that's what we're trying to do mathematically. Darwin himself was really more uh, focusing, was focusing more on uh, morphology and he was not really a mathematician. By contrast, what we've done is a morphometric study in trying to reach a definition for a species. The modern range of variation helps us. The technique has been applied to modern mammals, birds and reptiles and the mean value was in the order of minus 1.61. We did the same thing on invertebrates. Invertebrates, in other words beetles and butterflies, Coleoptera and Lepidoptera and we found the same log normal distribution of variation when you took pairwise comparisons. That <laughs> emboldened me to suggest that the value of minus 1.61 was an approximation, an approximation of a biological species constant. Minus 1.61 plus or minus 0.2 or 0.1. One final question, then if I may, otherwise this could go on for hours, but could one use this to actually resolve some taxonomic debates on, say, just crazy idea, maybe the uh, place for some, say, uh, Cambrian organisms where it's still not quite clear whether they should be considered as arthropods, for example, versus annelids versus one other supposed stem group. Is that uh, something that you could see happening? Well, we've applied it to Permian fossils. In South Africa we have therapsids, which are mammal-like reptiles, and these were first described by Owen, uh, a director of the British Museum of Natural History in London, and also others described by Huxley. And there is a case in point, if you look at Lystrosaurus, a mammal-like reptile that lived about 250 million years ago. There have been splitters even in 1860. Huxley and uh, the others had described separate species. And when we applied our statistical technique, we showed that whereas they had split Lystrosaurus into at least two species, we found that they were probably one. Yes, please, further questions? Oh, there here. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, I have a question from Prof. Pavel. It's uh, related to FOXP2 humanized uh, mouse. I'm just wondering if you have done any chip seek on the the binding site of the humanized uh, transcription factor and the original FOXP2 in the mouse and see the binding site and what are the genes that have been differentially regulated in these two? Yes, so that, that's a good question. There is actually an issue of having a good antibody to FOXP2 that is sort of works really well in ChIP-seq. What we are doing in the mice instead is single cell RNA-seq. We're sort of doing extensively single cell RNA-seq in newborn mice and a bit older mice, um, looking then in cells expressing FOXP2 and not expressing FOXP2 in the striatum and looking for gene sets are differently expressed. The other people have done ChIP-seq in mice uh, and have defined some genes that do have binding sites. Uh, but we have, yes, we haven't found an antibody that precipitates well, unfortunately. The question related to Neanderthal genome. 
I'm just wondering if you have done any comparison in the functional part of the regulatory element that like how much conserve uh, conservation between human and Neanderthal in terms of the functional part based on the result currently we have from the epigenome roadmap and all the data currently we have those uh, the functional part based on the biochemical assay and the sequencing data we have. Yes, so say there are if you take sort of well-defined regulatory elements from ensemble there are around 3,000 changes in those in that category that's fixed in, in present-day humans, ancestral in Neanderthals and Denisovans. We sort of did a little uh, pre-experiment where we took 25 of those changes in just a reporter construct, ancestral and derived form, and tested them in three neuronal cell lines, neuroblastoma cell lines, and about then half of 12 of them differed significantly in its ability to drive transcription in at least one of the cell lines. So yes, there are things there that have changed, but yes, it would be a tall order to analyze them systematically, and I don't quite know how one would do that, even now what the approach would be. So we're sort of going in the direction of doing multiple edits of CRISPR-Cas9 in iPS cells, one goal would be to make a cell line that makes the ancestral proteome, where we would actually put in those 97 changes. And another one would be then to select some group of things that have to do with expression. But what that functional group would be, and so we haven't started that. Any ideas would be great. Yes, Please go ahead. Um, I was just wondering what fast evolving sequences look like in Neanderthals, like retrotransposons or the Y chromosome. How does the Y chromosome look in, in, in Neanderthals? Well, so the Y chromosome is, is like the mitochondria. The, the Neanderthal Y chromosome falls way outside, um, and all present day Y chromosomes go back just 50,000 years or something like that to a common ancestor. I am not knowledgeable enough. I know people are studying retro posons and things like that in the Neanderthal genome. There is an issue with mapping. Of course, I should have stressed that what we have 50-fold coverage of is the part of the genome to which we can map 40-50 base pair fragments. So that's like two-thirds of the genome. So any repetitive things, we can only sort of talk about statistically, or if one is interested in a particular integration, you can look for the junction fragments. So there are people studying that, but somehow I am not up on that. So I also have a question from my very early career. I was really intrigued by schizophrenia, which is the disease of diseases in humans because it's so human. And we know we, people have identified a number of genes, hundreds actually, more than 200 genes have been identified in different contexts with schizophrenia. What gene, neuroregulin 2, is especially uh, related to schizophrenia? We know it's from GIVA studies and many other studies. But the very same gene is heavily connected with creativity in humans. It has been demonstrated by many recent studies. So some people say the price to have schizophrenia, more precisely, the price to have creativity in humankind is schizophrenia. And that's why this has not been selected hot during human evolution. Can you, with your approaches, analyze whether in the Neanderthalians or the Denisov people these genes were present and if so, to what extent, so were they creative on the one hand side, and maybe there were some schizophrenic patients among them as well, or is, is it possible with the presently available methodology? Well, so we of course know very little about variation among Neanderthals. We have now two high quality genomes actually, and five low quality, one two fold coverage genomes. Neuroregulin would just yes, be very interesting if we could look at it together. 
Um, there is one paper published uh, where one looked at GWAS studies, uh, hits for schizophrenia, and compared to a screen for positive selection that we published early on, uh, where one looks for regions among mod in modern human genomes where we seem to, it's, it's related to this desert concept, a sort of regions where we seem to select against Neanderthal variants, large regions. They saw a sort of statistical association between GWAS hits for schizophrenia tended to fall more often than randomly in such regions. Now we have made a more sophisticated selection model since then and I don't think the signal then holds up actually. But that doesn't exclude, of course, GWAS hits a sort of very mixed bag, some are good and some are not good. So it might be very interesting to look if you have a particularly good candidate, does it fall in these selected regions and do one then see some potential regulatory event or something like that. Be shy. This is not the opportunity to ask important questions. Daniela, you're here and silent. How comes? Please ask a question. Ah. Yes. If there are no questions just at the moment, I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, with regard to the genetic evidence now, that there was in fact a small degree of interbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. That's been published in this brilliant study presented by Swante. But in 1998, almost 20 years ago, I did a morphometric study of Neanderthal skulls and Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens skulls with Bernard van der Meers and colleagues, Jose Brago from Toulouse. And it was wonderful to just to explore the logosium statistic that we just developed. And to our great surprise, we found a small degree of overlap between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And we dared to publish, or at least submit, a paper for publication. And every time we tried to publish, it was rejected. Because the referees at that time were using alpha taxonomy. Neanderthals, A. Homo sapiens, B. They are discrete species, so they said. So our paper was rejected repeatedly. But eventually, in the year 2005, it was accepted in the annals of the Transvaal Museum. And it showed a small degree of overlap. And we were thrilled, absolutely thrilled, when the genetic data indicated a similar result. So in that particular instance, we were able to show that genetic and morphometric data were consistent. So I'm grateful to you, Swante, for helping support our case. Thank you. I sort of I really like this idea of, out of having a probabilistic species concept that doesn't make discrete groups, because I think we all agree that biology doesn't work that way. Species sort of slowly evolve into other species. So sort of what interested me in your talk was to realize what type of data does one need to put into your machinery? Can one take any type of morphology? Could it be postcranial morphology? How many features and what features goes into this? Thank you, that's a very good question. We've applied it to skulls, like Homo naledi versus everything else. And in that particular study, we showed that there was a difference indicating that a new species for naledi was warranted. To answer your question, you would take measurements that were common to both specimens. For modern specimens, obviously, you can deal with complete skulls. You can deal with complete teeth. You can indeed deal with complete postcrania, a complete femur. So you can take measurements from one femur versus measurements of another. 
we've done that. We've applied it to TEAS. A student of mine, Sue Dykes, is doing her PhD on first lower molars of the kind found in Australopithecus africanus. Remarkably, when she applied this method to taxa like Australopithecus africanus or Homo habilis and Homo erectus, just taking two specimens at a time, she found results that were consistent with what we'd got from modern taxa. You take what measurements you can that are common to both fossil specimens. And it's been quite exciting to show this consistency, whether you're dealing with postcrania, or whether you're dealing with teeth, or whether you're dealing with skulls. Right. So, please, ladies and gentlemen, don't be shy, ask questions. Yes, finally, Daniela. Genomics is that you get, collect huge data sets, right? And so you can find fine detail. But you talk about taxonomy, so the question, the question is very simplistic, is what, you know, how, what's the number of skulls that you need to study to come to the conclusions that you do, that, you know, that there are overlaps? You take what is available, so in the case of Australopithecus, we have, uh, for Australopithecus africanus, we have about 1,000 specimens, but it's teeth that are most common among those. Uh, taking what is available, you might have perhaps as many as 12 individuals, and you do pairwise comparisons and you get a, uh, a mean log SCM statistic and you can make a case that an assemblage, a sample of uh, hominins from a particular time period uh, at a particular site or at adjacent sites, the probability that that sample represents one species. In our case we are now dealing with quite substantial numbers of Australopithecus africanus from South Africa my student is applying this method to Australopithecus afarensis from Ethiopia, where Lucy was found. Lucy represents the species Australopithecus africanus, and there are now quite a number of teeth that we can analyze. And, and when Sue Dykes did this kind of an analysis for first lower molars, which are probably among the most common teeth that are preserved in our African hominin record. When she did it for afarensis, she got a value very close, not exactly, close to minus 1.6. When we applied it to the specimens of Africanus, again it was close to that value. I'll ask another one, a te very technical question. Is it possible to do bisulfite sequencing in a high throughput manner? Has anyone tried this? Um, that's probably very hard. I mean, it's so degraded already, so it's sort of, I wouldn't recommend that. What people do do to reconstruct the methylome, that there is an Israeli group uh, who uses the fact that the DNA is already deaminated to a big extent. The most common sort of hydrolytic modification is deamination. So cytosine becomes uracil, which is then appears as T when we sequence it. Um, we treat the DNA with uracil DNA glycosylase to get rid of this. So those things disappear generally. But if you have methylated C that becomes deaminated, it becomes a bona fide T. So that's resistant to uracil DNA glycosylase. So they actually use our data to reconstruct the methylome based on that. So for the high coverage genomes, you can reconstruct the methylome very well actually based on that. But that is certainly possible. 
And, and do you see any interesting patterns between, is it too early to say, or what have you have, down? They have one paper where they saw something that they said was interesting in the Hoxine cluster, that's the difference. However, it was also true that our genomes come from the peripheral part of the limb, the toes and the limb, and they compared it to chimps and humans from more proximal limbs, and that might be the difference there. If they do have a paper submitted now that claims to see many interesting differences that I should not talk about. Uh, but yes, the problem is a little bit, you study the methadone of bone, which is not the tissue you would have chosen if you could choose your tissue. Some of sort of methylation patterns are body-wide, I think. So there might be interesting things one can sort of get from that. That's the only in Rodias in gene expression they in the under You have a question, please. Uh, I have one question for Professor Pabo again. Um, based on your experience, what do you right now think is the oldest DNA that you could get any meaningful information out of. So I was wondering how far you could push this. Might resolve some of those debates on the taxonomy, actually. Yes, so the oldest DNA at all in the world comes from the permafrost. That's a, a horse genome that is almost 700,000 years that has been done in Denmark, but that has been continuously frozen. So outside the permafrost, the oldest DNA retrieved by Aslan and it's a hominin from a site called Atapuerca in Spain. It's a bit over 400,000 years, 430, 460,000 years. It's a deep limestone cave. We get tiny amounts of DNA, but in that we have something like four megabases of nuclear DNA from that hominin and the mitochondrial genome. It is an early sort of omnin, it's clearly omnin Neanderthal lineage. So this is some kind of an early Neanderthal or Neanderthal ancestor in Europe. Uh, that's, yes. So sort of, I would say under exception, we have looked at many other sites, sort of have about half a million, and have failed as the only site that's successful. So I would say, yes, somewhere between half a million and a million years is sort of the limit. There would be no Australopithecus, I think. Yes, please go ahead. Further questions? Yes, one more question. I'm just uh, wondering, have you done any cross-platform uh, sequencing analysis to see if by any chance you might get any bias from the sequencing platform you're using, especially when you're looking at the SNPs and all those single side information? Well, I mean, the first genome in 2010 was done partially on 454 and partly on Illumina. I wouldn't think that, you know, once you made your library and re replicated them, there is no difference between these sequencing libraries and other sequencing libraries from contemporary DNA. Uh, because you sort of amplify your libraries by PCR. Right? So, I would not think that there is any sort of particular bias that is not a bias that you would have looking at contemporary DNA also between platforms is sort of my tendency to think about this. I think there is quite interesting to explore sort of direct sequencing nanopore, Oxford nanopore and things like that where you would sequence directly the ancient DNA. You might be able to see modifications. You see whether it's a uracil as a deaminated uh, seed you might see other uh, modifications also. And that may be used actually as an indication to say which molecules are actually ancient in a, in a mixture where you have present-day contamination. Francis would like to comment on that. With regard to ancient DNA and the question that you were just given from this gentleman, uh, you were asked how far back can you go and you have indicated in the order of half a million to a million and you went on to say and this is recorded 
you went to <laughs> to say something that is really interesting. In 2017, on June the 6th, Swante Prabhu said that it was not possible to obtain DNA from Australopithecus. Wait another 10 years, sir. <laughs> I would be happy to be wrong again, you know. Yes, please. Please, please, please. If not, then I still have a little plot. I would like to ask our speakers to start a very short, as short as they would like to have it, as long as they would like to have it, brainstorming visual thinking session. So what would you like to see in the next 10 years or so, Francis and Santa, in your field? I would like more fossils. <laughs> and I have a dream. I have a dream to have one replica of Homo naledi in every school in South Africa. But I have another dream to have one replica of Homo naledi in every school in the world. That's it. Thank you. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think there are two things. Yes, being able to go further back or to find deep divergences that have survived for a long... I mean, something like Homo floresiensis, something that has diverged early from the human lineage but survived until within the last 100,000 years to be able to time changes along the human lineage, to have good genomes from deep divergences. But the other thing is sort of the second part of my talk, to understand the changes in our genome that sets modern humans apart, that made it possible for us and no other hominin to go from being at any one time, say, in the order of hundred thousands of individuals to becoming millions and billions of people and come to a situation today where we influence much of the biosphere. That has something to do with our very strange behavior, strange for being a primate. And I think that is hiding among those 30,000 changes in there. But the problem is which ones? Is it a handful of them or are these very complex traits that actually is a combination of many, many of these things you would have to do? So I, a dream would be to have iPS cells or what there will be in future containing all these changes in all combinations so we can actually test them. Thank you. Then I have a final plot. I would like to ask my co-organizer, Jan Fassbinder, to give his final words to this session. Well, that can be very short. This was a fantastic session. And I think we should thank the speakers once again for um, giving a great uh, contribution. Actually, we passed the halfway mark on the 10 on 10. This was the fifth of the 10 sessions we have. And I think it's halfway, it's, it, was, it was a peak. So you just put a challenge to us to create an even higher peak in the next five sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Everybody.